I think it's time to do another questions and answers type video. So I've got more questions to answer and while I'm doing that, I'll be uh, making something and I was so, I really like these slow colour changing LEDs so I decided I'm going to take a set of Poundland's um, standard Tungsten Fairlights and I'm going to convert them <clears throat> using one of these little commercial eBay special LED capacitive dropper driver things and I'm going to convert it into a colour changing set of lights. Don't know if it will work or not. It should work. We'll see how it goes. Uh, these might not like the having a high open circuit voltage across them if they go open circuit at any point in time but I'm sure we'll find out. And uh, tonight's uh, <coughs> Video is sponsored by Hersham Electrical and Ramsey, who generously donated me a bottle of uh, pink grapefruit gin, which is a uh, very nice, I have to say. This was a little Christmas present from them, and it says, "Made from Chase vodka, voted the world's best tasting vodka, distilled into gin with a refreshing citrus hit, enhanced by the bitter sweetness of pink grapefruit." So, um, <coughs> William Chase, Chase Distillery, Chase Farm, Rosemond, Herefordshire, UK. Yeah, this is nice. I have to say, I made the mistake of taking it over to my brother's. And Ralphie does like his uh, drinks, and uh, he drank far too much of it. I'm not going to do that again. That was a big mistake. But uh, as I was talking to Sam of Hersham, he said, you, you really like this. And it's one of these things that when you're young, strong flavours like grapefruit and like tonic water, it's not nice. But as you get older, you appreciate the more complex and perhaps tartar flavours and these two together, the grapefruit mm, mm. the grapefruit and the tonic water just make a fantastic drink, it's really nice Right, let's uh, start So, here's the standard strings of fair lights Another thing that's worth noting, British fair lights have the little white tipped uh, lamp and there's a difference between the white tipped and the standard clear ones, it's called a fuse lamp Let me demonstrate Inside a typical Fairy light. You have the pinch seal at the bottom and you have the Dume wire coming through, which is a this sort of reddish looking wire. It's an oxide coating uh, onto an iron, uh, iron copper wire. Um, the reason That's the reason it's red through there, the oxide coating. And it's a, a metal that's chosen to have thermal uh, characteristics very similar to glass. So it means when you pinch it into the glass seal, it, uh, it doesn't cause excessive stress as they cool down. It, it has the same sort of thermal coefficient of expansion. So these little wires come inside, this little glass bead usually inside just to support them. And then there's this sort of filament. I've drawn it a bit high, but that doesn't really matter. And normally in these lamps, there's a little tiny bit of wire with an oxide coating wrapped around the uh, connections. And the oxide coating normally acts as an insulator. And when the voltage across the lamp is 12 volts or whatever it is, then the filament will light as normal. However, if the filament breaks, then the voltage across the lamp goes up to the open circuit mains voltage momentarily. And that causes the oxide to break down. It, it, basically, it breaks down the insulation and shorts that lamp out. So this lamp uh, goes out of circuit, but, but shorts through. Um, and the rest of the lamp stay lit. The reason for the fuse lamp, which has the uh, white tip in it, to identify it as the fuse lamp, uh, is that it does not have that little wire wrapped around it. So that when it goes open circuit, it kills the whole set of lights. That's deliberate. It, it is literally a fuse. And the reason for that is because each time one of these goes out, it actually shorts out completely. It doesn't drop 12 volts anymore, so the voltage across the other lights goes up. And if too many went out, it would just have an avalanche effect that suddenly they'd all start popping. I did another video about this. Uh, everything you want to wanted to know about fairy lights or Christmas lights, I can't 100% remember now what it was called. But it was one of those everything you didn't want to know type of things. Um, so that's how they work. But what we're going to be doing here is I'm going to be using this capacitive dropper to adapt it. I'm going to, instead of uh, running these tungsten lamps in series, I'm going to, uh, well, we're going to get rid of this horrible label. I can't stand these labels. I know they're supposed to be there for identification of the correct replacement lamps. But, uh, they're very ugly big labels, and if you leave them on too long, they go all sticky and yucky. So let's get that off. Good result already. <coughs> so what we're going to be doing here is I'm going to be interrupting this lead fairly close to the plug and I'm going to be popping the capacitive dropper so let's chop that there and we'll strip those leads This stripper incidentally, because someone will ask, is a Unior stripper 
it's a generic, it's a very common type of stripper, it's not the automatic type. You set it to the range you work and uh, it, uh, it's a very simple stripper. When you close it down, it's got two metal V's that close and it pinches the insulation of the cable. Now, so the capacitive droppers, you can buy them on eBay. Uh, I should really try and find, I, I'll, if I remember, I'll put a search link down below in the description so you can find these, but they actually sell them in bulk. They're only about a pound each, maybe a, a dollar fifty each, if um, you buy them in uh, packs of ten. They're really very common, and inside it, it says LED controller, and it almost makes you think it's low voltage output, but it's not. It's a capacitive dropper inside, and um, you get them for different uh, ratings, 1 to 36, 37 to 50, and the most common is 50 to 80 pieces of LEDs, and the only real difference between them is the value of this capacitor, just to increase the current for the lower voltage drop uh, across this unit because of the higher number of LEDs in, in series. Uh, so my preference is the 50 to 80 pieces, but it doesn't really matter because, quite frankly, I recommend swapping the components anyway. So in this case, I've replaced the capacitor with a 229 nanofarad one, and I've replaced the electrolytic here with a 400 volt 10 microfarad one for extra smoothing and extra voltage uh, rating because uh, you know the ones that are usually supplied are 250 volts. And the case of this uh, arrangement, if you, it means if you pull a lamp out, it will go fully open circuit. So it's better to have that uh, higher voltage capacitor. So I shall put these in, and once we get into the actual the swing of things, then I'll start answering questions, including what are the questions? Biggest bang? Yes. Biggest electrical bang is going to be a good one. Closest shave at work? Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Why did I start making videos? Uh, do I watch the TT races? Um, uh, fairground involvement? Lots of questions to answer. It's just... I'll see how many I get through in this video. So to start with, uh, I'm sticking this lead in here. Is this going to fit in easily or is it going to scrunch all the strands up as sometimes happens? I think it's going to try and scrunch all the strands up. So let's uh, stuff that through that hole and stuff it. Actually, I'll solder that now before it pops out again. You can hear the soldier iron cycling on and off in the background because it's making its characteristic little buzzing noise. In with the other mains connection, noting to get it in the right hand, right correct side, uh, going to the right far via the capacitor. Don't want to get it in the wrong side, that would be a wee bit dramatic. What would happen if I did it on the wrong side? Oh, that would be dramatic. That would be basically across an electrolytic capacitor. That would be thrilling. <laughs> so today, uh, as I'm doing this, is the 30th of December. So tomorrow's New Year's Eve. A Saturday, which is quite nice. Any strands? I can't make, I feel guilty making, there's a standard uh, joke in the elevator industry, the lift industry, that, you know, when people have a little incident where they've got strands sticking out and they short together, they call it a George Michael. But that's a bit sad because, like, he's just passed recently, which is genuinely sad, because uh, he was a really talented singer and, and you know, songwriter. But uh, they called it the, the, they call it a George Michael because the little whiskers that stick out, they call it the careless whiskers. Careless whisper, gearless whiskers. So, uh, yeah, usually quite loud in the elevator industry, owing to the fact that elevator equipment tends to operate at high current and high voltage. Owing to the fact that it has to hoik lots of people up and down all the time. Elevator trivia. An unloaded elevator is takes as much power to lift as a fully loaded elevator because the counterbalance weight is designed for half load. I just thought I'd mention that. For no good reason at all. You tend to think that if an elevator was empty, it would actually be, draw virtually no power, but in reality, that's one of the worst-case scenarios. That is possibly one of the highest loads. And the reason for that is really the ropes just go over a sheave at the top. Um, and uh, so it makes sense to have to counterbalance about half the weight of the elevator to avoid slipping on those uh, sheaves. It means that either fully unloaded or fully loaded is a, a, a roughly equivalent sort of... Uh, stress on the, the rope uh, as it passes over that sheave to avoid it slipping. Sheave, other, otherwise known as a big pulley, really. 
But in the elevator industry, they call it a sheave. Sheave. Right. So we're almost done with making our power supply up, and I just have to note which is the positive here. And find out which end of the lights it starts at. So let's uh, trace that out. So the capacitor, the negative of the capacitor is there, so that's negative, and this is the positive coming via this resistor. Okay, so this is the positive. So I'm going to unravel it now. Oh, it's a little bit longer than I was expecting. This is going to make a huge mess, isn't it? Perhaps I should have unraveled it before I soldered those wires in, but not to worry. I've done it. And I'm going to mark it with the one of the Sharpies that Jay sent. So I'm going to mark that as positive, because now, because it's LED, it's going to be, the polarity is going to be important all the way through. In fact, you know what? I might put a little tie wrap just on that, just to remind me, because it makes it easier. One moment. Temperature addition of a yellow tie wrap, just as a re reminder that that's a positive end. If I was to plug this in now, will I plug it in now? Yes, I'll plug it in now. Uh, nothing would really happen, because uh, the... Well, at first start, this... Uh, I wonder if this set's been returned, because this lamp's got the tip's broken off, and it's gone cloudy inside, suggesting this has been lit while it was uh, that lamp was broken. So let's put this into a little case. Does it have any sort of... Yeah, it's got uh, DC output. I'll put it in that way. Just so it looks sort of like it's, the wires do correlate to the label on it. doesn't really matter. I'm not really bothered. And we'll clip that cover on. There we go. Um, in the other ones I've done, I've, I've made some sets of these up for my brother. Uh, and uh, just so his house is sort of general low-level illumination uh, for my mum and my brother to enjoy. And uh, I just put cable ties around these as an extra precaution. I'll move that box out of the way now. Right. So... This is the point that I start taking out LED uh, lamps. So let's uh, replace that one so we can test these and replace them with LEDs. And the first one, I'm just going to do that right now, first start off. So here's one of the bases. Here's the pack of LEDs. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to insert, I've pulled the lamp out because the lamps, say this broken one, you can just pull it and they pop right out. Uh, and then the LED sits in. Now, these LEDs have the short leads. That's annoying. I'd rather they'd been the long leads. But having said that, I notice that these holders comfortably accommodate the LED. It actually goes in as if it's designed to take them. So uh, I'm just going to fold the leads over. And the long lead is a positive. So once again, I'm going to crack out uh, Jay's pen. And I'm going to put a wee mark on here just to show that's the positive side. And then I'm going to use my snips here, angled with the uh, tips down, to actually crop them so the, the folded leads don't stick down below the, uh, beyond this sort of sleeve here, because otherwise uh, it stops the lamp going in, it wedges, or it actually wedges it in completely. So theoretically now, if I pull this light out and I stick this one in with the positive pointing in that direction then this LED should light if I plug this in it might just go bang you just never know it's lit that's a good start and what's actually happening is the current is passing through these lamps but none of them are lighting because um, the actual current is so low that it's it's not enough to make them glow even though they're conducting uh, but it's enough to make the LED glow but, um, once uh, we get along, each time I take one of these lamps out and replace it, it's going to uh, just it's going to add that extra sort of LED in line, and gradually there'll be less lamps and more lit LEDs. So let's do that, and while I'm doing that, let's uh, start answering the questions, because this is where it all goes a bit therapeutic and and relaxed. So I'm just going to turn the solder on off because it's not needed anymore. <clears throat> right. So, uh, biggest bang ever, right, okay, that was with Husman Refrigeration, lots of big bangs and exciting shocks and things with Husman Refrigeration, because uh, Husman Refrigeration involved lots of high-power industrial equipment, uh, and when things go wrong with high-power industrial equipment, it tends to be quite loud, in a sort of funny but also quite scary way. 
So um, what happened there was a uh, husband had just taken over a contract uh, to do maintenance on a whole load of stores. And as happens when a company takes over a, a contract like that, they'll send the engineers out to um, check it out. You know, uh, I basically, me, uh, an apprentice and a an refrigeration engineer went out. We did a sort of tour of Scotland around all these uh, supermarkets that had been uh, taken on contract. And the idea was it we went into each supermarket and we checked out the refrigeration plant and... Uh, we looked for any obvious things. We we just did it. We cased out the joint, so to speak, in a way. It was just seeing what was likely to go wrong, if any botched repairs, if anything was likely to go wrong near, if there was any signs of burnt cables or anything like that. And so we were going around all these uh, supermarkets, and basically, th I think it was about three we did a day, and then in the evening we just stayed in local accommodation for that day and then moved on to the next. This is going to get. This is not blood by the way. I just like to mention that. So, went into one particular supermarket and uh, I was just checking over the uh, compressor pack. Now, a compressor pack is basically, it's, uh, let, let me doodle this, let me doodle a compressor pack. A typical refrigeration compressor pack, I'll just check that LED, yep, they're all working. <coughs> is designed to service lots and lots of cases in a fridge, so in a supermarket. So supposing you've got all the aisles of the supermarket with all the, the freezer stuff all down the side, instead of like being an individual compressor per uh, freezer, you have a huge, you have re re really massive big compressors uh, sitting in stacks. Uh, and it used to be you had lots of individual compressors, but laterally they built them into a big metal frame with the huge receiver tank for the refrigerant, the liquid refrigerant, and then the front of that, there'd be a big control panel, or it would be in the end. And uh, inside was all the control gear for all these compressors. And typically, you'd have about eight compressors, six, eight, or more compressors in a pack. And they'd just switch them in as needed. Uh, as you know, there was more demand for refrigeration. More compressors would kick in. And off the top of this would be all the different pipes leading out to all the different cases, supplying the uh, gas as needed, the liquid as needed, and taking the gas back through the, the condenser units and then filling the tank with the liquid again, ready for, for, the, next, uh, for the next cycle. And uh, <clears throat> also the control panel would be cables, and there'd be basically one, either a multi-core feeding several cases or one cable with um, <clears throat> three or four cores per case. Uh, four core, I think it was. The standard colour code, it was used the standard electrical colour code in the UK, red, yellow, blue and black at that time. It's been changed to comply with European regulations. Black was neutral. Uh, in this case, it wasn't the phases they were using, though. Red was the defrost heater. Yellow was the lighting, because, you know, you think yellow, bright light. Blue was the refrigeration processing circuitry, um, like the fans and the valves and stuff like that. And red was the sort of the defrost heater. So you think glowing red hot. It was just dead easy to to remember. So inside these packs was, uh, a, it was a common arrangement to have a device called a cam timer, which would have uh, an assembly of cams inside. And it would have a series of switches with little uh, standard micro switches with little stems coming out onto the cams. And the idea of the cams was that uh, because the system has to defrost the cabinets in a cycle every day or every 12 hours, that would rotate and it would trigger in sequence so they didn't all do it at once. It would trigger all the different defrost sequences. And because every case was in a different phase because the the defrost heater was quite a high load and there you wanted to keep the same phase in every case um, just for, for safety reasons. Uh, it meant that there was alternate red, yellow, blue, red, yellow, blue along this uh, along this uh, cam switch timer bank. So I went in and it was common practice just to get a screwdriver uh, and just standard bare screwdriver and just poke the switches in to initiate a defrost sequence if you're testing it. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll test defrost sequences in this. And I poked it in. What a fucking bang. Seriously, it was just enormous. <laughs> the whole thing just went... <laughs> it was huge. And I was like... There was sudden silence. All the compressors stopped. And the eyes were just like... All I could see was dots in the eyes. <laughs> I didn't know what happened. And 
I thought, as the vision recovered, it was like, I thought, what have I done? What have I done? Everything stopped. What had happened was that uh, th this was a cheap cam switch. <laughs> and instead of the the micro switches with insulated levers, it was actually just brass contacts. <laughs> when I poked it, I shorted it to the case. But it wasn't just a small thing, because when that flashed, it flashed over onto the one next to it. Uh, and it also went bang, and <laughs> it flashed over onto the one next to it. And every single control circuit a breaker in that cabinet tripped. So I was like going trip, switching all the back on, and as I switched them on, all the compressors were starting. It was like the relief, the likes of cold sweat in our hands. <laughs> it was a terrible experience. And then I went back and looked at it and thought, what on earth happened there? <laughs> the little metal, there was an aluminium section of spacers, uh, a, a spacer strip. <laughs> when I touched it, there was a big skid mark out it where the screwdriver had shorted onto. But then I noticed all the, all the way along behind every other one, there was another skid mark because, like, all these electricians had been going in before me and doing exactly the same thing, and it blew up. <laughs> so I wasn't the first. That was funny. <laughs> it wasn't funny at the time, it was funny afterwards. <laughs> And I went and got my colleagues and said, oh, I think you should see this. This is really important. See if you're working in these uh, cases. Watch out for these little cam switches because they're not like the normal ones we're used to. Uh, it's the, the shitty ones that, uh, that blow up. <laughs> and uh, so I told my colleagues and they said, oh, we'll keep an eye out for that in future. And they all confessed later on that even though I told them, they all did it. <laughs> it was a really common thing to blow up the packs like that. <laughs> <laughs> As I say, when, when you do it, it, it causes an avalanche effect. It was just ridiculous. But yes, that was the loudest bang. <laughs> Funniest bang as well, just because the way it happened. Right, so next question, closest scrape. Closest scrape uh, was also with uh, Hussman and also with a compressor pack. When the compressor packs, uh, when a compressor failed, well, that's not going in too well, is it? Let's see if it's gone in enough to make a connection. Yes, it has. When a compressor failed, the normal sequence of events was that uh, one of the electricians would go in and disconnect the compressor. And you can't, uh, in a supermarket, you can't just say, right, I'm going to turn off the entire refrigeration system to work on the, the thing, because if you do... As soon as you've turned that off, uh, all the refrigeration's off and all the cases that are on that pack will start going into alarm mode. So what you do is you just isolate the section you're working on. And long day. Uh, isolate the wrong section. Oh, dear. And uh, basically speaking, I was the only way to get access to the junction box on top of these big Copeland compressors was... An, on the top and because the packs were so compact you had to shimmy in so I was actually sandwiched in between the metal receiver and top the compressors very limited area working on the junction box in the compressor uh, just it was such a nightmare scenario I was soaking with sweat the overalls were just like damp with sweat uh, on the metal work really noisy room it could have been so dramatic uh, what actually happened was I put my uh, socket, I had the deep socket set, uh, and I put it onto the handle of the ratchet, uh, tried it for size, put it onto the terminal, and right the second I lifted it off the phase terminal, the, keep in mind this is the metal ratchet, the second I lifted it off, the compressor went, Doom, and it started, and I was like, fucking hell. That was such, you know, it was a real wake-up call, you know, uh, to double-check things uh, and make sure... I know these days you're, they say lockout, tagout. To be honest, uh, you, at that time you, and still now, I guess they probably work that way. There are some things you can't just turn it off, not without clearing all the cases out and going through a whole rigmarole. But that was a, uh, that was exciting. That made me sit down and think for a moment after that. And then I went and continued the job, disconnect the correct one, um, and carried on. Let's give this another wee buzz and see. Yep, that's looking good. Why did I start making videos is the next question. Well, my favourite videos online are people like... Um, Mike's Electric stuff's really good, and uh, Julian Illett, uh, Dave at EEV blog. Um, Connor Wolf is also another sort of uh, workshop. He doesn't put up many videos, but his videos are good. 
And I was watching all these videos, and it's not just uh, electrical and electronic videos. Uh, there's another one, uh, Jerry Corner uh, in Canada, and of course, Ave and DeResta. You know, it's great just to sort of, the videos where you're just basically hanging over someone's shoulder in the workshop, like you are right now, and you're just watching them work. And so when I came over here to Isle of Man, and uh, I, like, needed to set up a workshop, so when I could, I set up my bench, and um, when I did that, uh, I just thought, well, you know, it makes sense to put some lighting here that's going to flood the, the bench with a nice amount of light, and also... I've got a couple of little shelf brackets that slide out and the iPad sits on top so it just points down the bench and it doesn't get too, it, it gets in the way a bit. You, you'll often see me going over to this side a wee bit because uh, when I want to see something close because the, the iPad is basically blocking this whole area sort of here. Um, so it kind of it does restrict where I can actually go in the bench. But uh, I thought, you know, um, in the same way I watch other people's videos, what do they watch? You know, it, 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 I like to contribute back to the internet in the same way that, in the same, you know, I liked uh, electronic websites, so I originally set up bigclive.com in that same way that I just thought, you know, let's put up a project site to, and initially I didn't even have advertising for a long time on the, uh, the bigclive.com website because I grew up when the internet was completely advert free. Now I realise that, you know, it does pay for things. I mean, YouTube would not exist without advertising, so it needs the advertising for Google to be able to provide that service. So I started making the videos, and it wasn't ever intended to become as big as it came. It just seemed to take off. And I suppose in many ways the Fanny Flambo video helped there, because although it's all the wrong type of people that come to the Fanny Flambo video, for those of you who haven't seen the Fanny Flambo video, if you search my channel for Dangerous Japanese Doll, it's basically a spoof. It's a, a doll with a firework stuck up its rectum. <laughs> that, uh, it, I made it all with fake instructions and as if it was some dangerous Japanese toy. Because the Japanese have some very, very weird television programs and toys. And it was this toy that I supposedly got out of Poundland, and it was like, uh, I was reading the instructions of how to use its flamethrower, which involved spread-eagling it on the ground and then lighting its ass. Um, and that went viral. It didn't go viral straight away, as these things do. They just uh, simmered until people spot it and share it with a friend. And then, it just suddenly, while I was doing the Christmas lights in George Square, I woke up in the morning, and the phone was just, the, it was just email overdrive. Because at that point, uh, I still got email notifications for every message sent. That I had to stop that a long time ago. Uh, because uh, this channel gets so much email, uh, so many comments, that it, it swamped the email. So it uh, was quite interesting watching it just evolve during the day. You know, it just got so many hits. <clears throat> and there's a, unfortunately, there's also a, a timely tale that I can share with you regarding that. Because... When you make a viral video, lots of companies get in touch with you and they say, we are media representation companies and we'll represent it to the television, you know, like RidTube and things like that, to sort of TV programmes that do these video clips. <clears throat> and we'll also get enhanced monetization, and uh, we'll operate revenue share. And uh, Duke and Media was one of those companies that got in touch and they had seemed to have lots of high-profile um, company, you know, uh, videos on their sort of records. And the idea was that it was a 60-40 split, 60% to me, 40% of the advertising revenue to them. And I thought, well, okay, let's give this a go. And that was one of the worst decisions I ever made because Chicken Media did not, uh, they made me sign the, the rights over to the video, so I don't have the copyright to that anymore. They were also supposed to protect it from being ripped off, and they just don't. And they take all the advertising revenue, and it's only recently, after a lot of hounding them, they grudgingly gave me a hundred bucks just to shut me up. Uh, worst, you know, I, I'm not going to... It, it's good that it happened, because I won't ever do it again. I won't ever sign the rights to a video over to another company. Because, uh, and if you ever have a viral video, or a video that could be viral... Just be aware that these companies do that uh, and they're just looking to make money off your back. The same with the channels. Uh, if you have a successful uh, YouTube channel, 
you'll get people saying we're a network and uh, you know we'd love to have your channel on our network. What that basically means is that you'll end up making the content for them. They'll take all the money, give you a small cut in return, but you're tied into them to make content on an ongoing basis to keep them in cash. It's all it's all a bit sordid. But uh, that's just because really the the whole the industry is just evolving. Uh, YouTube is still new in that aspect. So that's the sordid tale of Fanny Flambeau, which I use kind of as a loss leader. It still brings people to the channel, but it keeps getting ripped off on uh, Facebook as well. But I just don't give a toss anymore because it's not I'm not earning money off it, so I don't care. I don't do anything about that. It's also a, a good reason to have, if you make videos, to have your name of your channel in the video like this. That's why I put this here, because that was a, another lesson that, you know, if people can't, if it, you've got a video going viral, it's been freebooted on Facebook. If people don't know where it came from, they won't come to the channel. They won't ever recognise that. So it would be useful to get that traffic to your channel. Timely lessons. Next question. The TT. The TT races, uh, do I watch them? Now, the TT races are a bike race, a really, really dangerous bike race on the Isle of Man that is basically just round the streets of the Isle of Man. And it passes quite near here. In some of videos, you'll actually hear it running in the background. And to be honest, I don't watch it live. Uh, it's best watched on TV. When you see the edited highlights of the TT, you're getting a really good experience because you're able to follow the bikes around the track. You're able to see all the on-bike footage, which is spectacular. It's all done with drones and uh, onboard footage cams, but sort of, they seem to have this really good reception system that it's sort of live action upload. Um, but... Um, the real race, if you're actually next to the TT racetrack, there's no point watching it, but it, a lot of people do, but it's more a social thing, it's sort of grab a coffee or a beer and stand next to the track, because uh, it, it's too fast, it really is one of the deadliest, fastest races there is. It's such a dangerous race that people die on it every year, but I don't really approve of that aspect of it, but I do recognise that, you know, it wouldn't be the TT. It wouldn't be that type of race. It wouldn't be so popular if it wasn't dangerous. So you just have to allow for the fact that, you know, some people do want to live on the edge. And the TT lets them do that. It's uh, I do love the atmosphere, though, when the TT's on. The whole island just comes alive because... Uh, Normally, it's a fairly quiet island during the year, but uh, at TT time, it's just a wash with bikers and bikes. Uh, also, a wee bit scared on the road because they're usually driving like crazy maniacs, but um, that's just that's just the Isle of Man. It's uh, sort of one of the, if not the, bike racing capitals of the world. It's It's a crazy race. Very controversial. Eh... Uh, Fairground involvement. How did I end up building fairground lighting controllers? That goes back to primary school. Um, there's another video I'm going to make about a place called Summerhill Glen in the Isle of Man. It's a place I was taken to when I was a kid and it had an absolutely mega impression. It's an illuminated glen and it's one of the earliest illuminated glens and they really... Douglas counts. It's in Douglas and Isle of Man. And Douglas Council maintains it really well. There's a guy called Donnell who works with the council and he's obviously, he's a sort of manages this lighting side and it's very clear that he actually gives a shit. He really cares about the lighting in Douglas. The Christmas lighting is good and the Glen, he's kept it in really good shape uh, with sort of evolving the lighting in it. It's, it's maintained well. Uh, I have recorded a brief section of video of that during dusk at the Glen but uh, it wasn't lit at the time, so I'm going to have to try and get back before the season's over um, to record some footage when it's actually lit up. It won't be very bright because it is quite a gloomy glen. The lighting is ideal for human eyes, but not so great for cameras. But it mainly involves lots of waterfalls and limited bridges and characters. It's really nice. It, even now, as an adult, it looks a lot smaller, but it's really nice. And that kind of had a big impact when I was young. It just made me love lighting, and that kind of set the career off. But when I was at primary school, the fairground used to visit, and uh, a chap called Timmy Finlay uh, was at the school, and I got to know him, just befriended him, and 
uh, went up to the fairground and hung about up there. And they were taking the rides down, and I was helping them take uh, empty one of the arcades and dismantle one of the rides. And uh, it's just, uh, I was introduced to another chap, uh, John Irvin, and just it, it made friendships really at the time. And latterly, uh, when I got, was older, I kept in touch with them. Latterly, when I was older, uh, John Irvin introduced me to Raymond Cardona, who is a, a showman who owned a ride called the Hellraiser Waltzer, and he absolutely loved his lighting. He could not get enough lighting in his ride, like super high energy Las Vegas style lighting. I'm just going to check these. And, oh, look, that one is kind of really skipped in the sequence, hasn't it? Is that? Oh, that one's lighting blue. Oh no, they're all lighting random colours. Okay, radio. That's interesting. So Raymond uh, was, all his light controllers were just a huge big pile of controllers. Uh, and we talked about, I, I used to fix them for him, but it was quite tricky fixing some of them. They weren't really what you'd call maintenance friendly. So together we designed some new light controllers and tested them. And uh, then we had a batch of circuit boards made and the rest was history. We ended up uh, making a lot of fairground lighting equipment. It was a uh, fun times. That was uh, while I was working with Hussman as well. Uh, it all really, basically, yeah, it all just happened in tandem. So uh, it was interspersed when Hussman were quiet because uh, I was freelance at that point in time. Um, the, I would just build controllers or build them in the evening if uh, I was working during the day, which was sometimes quite intense, I have to say, you know, trying to juggle everything, particularly if someone placed an order for a large number of controllers. Um, a company called ERM used to use uh, my controllers and all the rides. And they used to buy them as a sort of batch at a time, but usually leave it to the very last minute to order them. That's when I'd use the big printed circuit board frame and clip loads of circuit boards and then try and solder them all without falling asleep. I did actually manage at least once to fall asleep while soldering, which is quite spectacular. Didn't, I went into automatic defence mode, as human bodies do, and just the soldier iron just hovered above the component. Uh, very odd. Just a couple more, and that's uh, this complete. So, um, yeah, the, the fairground, that also involved, just for fun, travelling with the fairground. Um, travelling with the Hellraiser, doing ride lighting maintenance on it uh, in Tilburg, at Tilburg Kermis which is a big fairground uh, event in uh, Holland, in the Netherlands, which the Dutch take their fairgrounds very, very seriously. If, when they have a fairground in the... Well, the Germans also take their fairgrounds very seriously. They're very, very stylish, much... Uh, much more spectacular than uh, typical British rides. A lot, of the, a lot of the British rides ended up being bought from places like Germany and Holland. And Italy. Um, but yeah, fun times. Fun times indeed, and they've not stopped yet. So here's the last LED going in. So I'll just mark that with the positive side, just as a precaution. If I put these LEDs in the wrong way around, they will almost certainly fail instantly. Which isn't really what I want. So that goes in there. And then they should all light. Yes, they do. Let's see if I can not cause a huge avalanche onto my bench here. So here's the uh, string of lights. I'm going to turn this off. And once again, let's see. They are all holding the colour. They're doing quite well. <coughs> Two things I'm looking for here. Is the current going to be high enough to allow the colours like yellow and um, magenta to actually look properly yellow and magenta? But the magenta is working, that's good. Because if the current's too low, the red takes priority. The red pulls the voltage down and it means there's a bias towards red. But this looks pretty good. That looks very nice. And once again, they'll just scatter. They'll just randomly move out of sync. Time for some more uh, gin to celebrate this. Gin and... Um, Oh, that grapefruit gin is spectacular. 
I'm not what you'd call an aficionado of liquor, but that is spectacular. So definitely thanks to Sam at Hersham for that. That's uh, really nice. So uh, this is just going to go out of sequence. Now, what I'm going to do now then, let's turn the light back on, Swamparama, and plug this into the power meter and see what sort of current it's drawing. I don't think it's going to be that high. I'm just being wary of the fact there is a pile of stuff, including meters, of trying to find its way down to the bench. Power consumption is 0.7 watts, if that. Um, 237 volts at the moment. Uh, 15 milliamps. I was kind of expecting 15 to 20, so that's pretty good. So there's 20 lights, typically about, uh, say about, I estimated about 4 volts across each LED. Uh, so about 80 volts times, hold on, let's uh, just do the maths. It'll be somewhere between 3 or 4 volts across the LEDs. So combined, typically about 80 times 0 0.015 equals about 1.2 watts. I'd say it's probably going to be in the region of 1 watt. This uh, meter thinks it's probably around about 0.7 watt. That's probably close enough. 0.6 watt. Yeah, I'd say a watt at max, if that. Um, which means that uh, the whole string of these colour changing lights is now taking less than one of the original tungsten lamps. So that's that's good. That's nice. That's a pleasant effect. That's really nice indeed. And there's no, there's no. Well, you can see there's no visible flicker. It's just uh, doing its thing and merging between the colours. And the longer that's left, the more they'll go out of sync. And that was a, a Poundland set of lights, some cheap LEDs from eBay. I, I'll put a, a search link down below again, like I did in the previous video. And that's one of these little, you know. 10 for £10 or something, little capacitive droppers, but augmented. So I'd say between the adding the extra components, the total cost of making the set of lights was probably about £4, if that. Yeah, that's pretty good. That's a good result. I do like that. That's looking pretty neat. Bonus footage. What would happen if I took one of these LEDs out, boing, and turned it round and plugged it in the wrong way round? Oh, right, okay, so it's not lighting, but will it work if I turn it back round? Uh, it's still working. That's very impressive. I thought that would have killed it, but it's not. Let's try and kill it again. There's a bright flash when I plug it in because the capacitor's fully charged and it's got a 470 ohm resistor in the dropper uh, to limit the current. But uh, let's uh, change that round again then. Red, green, blue. It survived. That's very impressive. I wasn't expecting it to survive. So that's a, that's a bonus result.